we were excluded from the benefits uh, because of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. So um, basically that's the, um, that's the welfare reform. And how that is, is that, is that so like in Iowa, we're not qualified for assistance unless we have a citizen, a dependent that's a citizen was born here. Um, so those like type of assistance would be food stamps, Medicaid, Medicare, um, and yeah. So, okay, so let me ask this question. So here, you know, the, the U.S. convinces the Marshall Islands to, you know, really just some devastating, horrific acts. The implications of those are far reaching. But, you know, they reach back out and say, hey, let's create this COFA agreement. Um, it allows you to come to the United States. It allows you to work here in the United States. And it allows you um, free health care because of these implications. But then in the 1990s, there's welfare reform that happens um, on a federal level. And those promises of, of health care are taken away. Is that, is that correct? So what happened... Do you know much about what happened there or all of a sudden you had health care, now you don't? Um, I think I, I've done a little bit of research on it uh, because even before all the, the welfare reform, mm -hmm. you know, we were able to uh, get free medical. Yes. You know, I used to live in Hawaii. We used to be in Hawaii. You know, we lived in Hawaii and, you know, I remember having my own medical card. Mm -hmm. And if I get hurt, you know, whether I, I'm in high school, you know, things like that, sure. I would go straight to my doctor with that card. Yes. Having our family not, you know, mm -hmm. paying anything yes. because of the agreement that was given mm -hmm. by the U.S. government to, you know, the COFA migrants and, you know, the health implications that happened during the bombings and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then, you know, 1996, you know, welfare reform, you know, the status of being an, you know, immigrant changes a little bit because as a, as a Marshallese citizen um, or migrant, we, uh, we have this, uh, we, we, we live in America with our I-94. There's a pass they give us when we enter into United States that basically would, you know, be definite for us to stay, live, work in America. If we lose that, you know, I-94 card, then there's no way we could go back ever back home. So then um, we'll have to, national security will have to take their place and, you know, investigate things like that. But talk about the welfare reform, you know, when I think a little bit of why it changed you know, because of our status, a lawful, you know, resident, U.S. resident or permanent resident. Yes. It doesn't really fall into uh, the welfare reform where immigrants are uh, a green card holder, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of that, you know, I can understand. It just doesn't explain a lot of why it really happened. Or right. Why right. they took away right. that right. privilege things yeah. like that so you know one day i would want to understand what's going to happen so yeah right right well and um you know for our viewers who are tuning in now we're um with the levi family talking about the disproportionate impact that COVID 19 has had on um the Marshallese community. We've gone over a little bit of their history of um, the U.S. doing nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands and the far-reaching horrific implications that that led to um, food supplies being, you know, having radiation fallout um, and then health, sweeping health implications like cancers and diabetes and other kinds of things. Um, and, you know, just some of those painful realities. When uh, this COFA agreement happened, there was, you know, promise of free, free health care to remedy some of these horrific things that the U.S. had done in the Marshall Islands. Um, but in the 1990s with welfare reform, that was taken back. So it was taken back. So how do you receive health care now um, in light of all of this? 
So currently, um, as COFA migrants or as so Marshallese or Pacific Islanders, we have limited access to health care benefits. Um, I don't have health insurance, but I can enroll in health insurance through my employer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I didn't do that just because it's a lot of dedu deductions. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, I know for, um, for Marshallese in this community, they can enroll in healthcare through their employment as well. Um, but most of them, they work in, um, they work at like Crescent Community, not Crescent, I apologize. They work at the agency, job agency, like Express Employment and Sedona. And if, when you work for those, for those agencies, you, if you're a temporary worker, you can't enroll in healthcare. Um, unless if you get hired by um, the employer. Sure. Uh, a lot of Pacific Islanders work as housekeepers here and um, housekeepers only get paid um, about the minimum, minimum wage. And because of that, um, they can't afford to enroll in healthcare or their, uh, through their employer's health insurance. In this case, we all go to Crescent Community Center for a VNA for healthcare. Um, that's where we would go and follow up. Yeah. Well, and let me interject too on the minimum wage piece. Um, you know, that's for those of you who are tuning in um, who don't know, but seven twenty-five an hour is the minimum wage in the United States um, and here in Iowa. And um, you know, if you do the math, you, that's if you work uh, all week long, forty hours a week, every you know working week you can. That's roughly just over fifteen thousand dollars um, a year and sometimes Iowa families are paying about 10,000 for just child care I mean you think about the cost of living your home food transportation um, you know health care like that those kind of wages um, are making people choose whether or not they pay for health care um, or they pay their rent or they pay their transportation. I mean, these are really impossible choices that you know we've put our Marshallese Lee's community um, in. You know, and it is it is just heart wrenching to hear about you know all of the horrific acts the United States you know had, had done in the Marshall Islands, and then to pull away healthcare and not care for you has been. I mean, that's very unjust. Um, and so I'm glad that you are sharing these stories and you know and speaking out. Um, and Crescent Community Health Center is um, such an um, amazing entity in Dubuque. For those of you who um, are tuning in and don't know much about Crescent, um, Crescent is a healthcare facility that um, helps uh, low to moderate income uh, individuals or those who don't have health insurance get the kind of healthcare they need. Um, and they do have a Pacific Islander project, I believe, is housed or somehow connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone from Crescent, I'm sure, will explain that to me later. But, you know, they're doing incredible outreach in the community and so grateful for their work and for their healthcare professionals there. But, um, yes. So that kind of leads us into, you know, COVID-19. Um, you have someone close to you who has um, been impacted by COVID-19. And I know that um, we've had I believe four four deaths um, in in Dubuque. That um, or correct me if I'm wrong, um, Marlon. Did you say five? Maybe we have between four or five deaths recently. Um, so since this COVID nineteen, the number of deaths have increased to a total of six recently in less than a month. In um, month. Yes, less than a month. I am so sorry to hear that. So you tell me, I mean, tell me what's going on. You know, what are the stories you're hearing? You know someone personally who has been affected by this. Talk um, to me about those experiences. I just want to give my uh, condolences to all the family members here in, in the Marshallese community, as well as everyone else in Iowa and across the nation. You know, it's, it's sad. Mm -hmm. um, as a Marshallese, it's very, it's even sadder because, you know, we, we you know, we take, you know, life seriously, mm -hmm. things like that, yeah. as uh, I'm sure everybody does. Um, but, you know, these are people who you grew up with, you spoke with, you had conversation with, and things like that, and suddenly they just left this life and, you know, you know, this virus 
has taken a toll on a lot, a lot and many, many people, many souls. Um, but, you know, it's a shocking feeling when you hear that, you know, you have someone very close to you tested positive, you know, for, for yeah. COVID-19. Yes. You know, two weeks ago, you know, terrifying. You know, from learning and hours of studying about the virus and mainly because we know, you know, many have suffered tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we know that some people may experience different types of symptoms. Some may be at risk. And, you know, our thoughts and, you know, our thoughts were just praying for them. Yes. You know, and praying that none of, none of us would ever go down that, you know, road, you know, life or death. But then again, you know, only our body's immune system can determine its outcome. And that's what's scary about this virus. You know, you don't know if you can, your body can relate to it. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily, you know, you know, they survived it. And I'm glad they did. You know, it's a battle that you, only you can, bat, you know, you can fight on your own. Um, you, know, our, you know, our support is just prayer. Yeah. You know, I know they survived it. You know, this person very close to us survived it. He signed off. He, he was able to go back to work. Um, his, I think I think his, his experience was good for me mm -hmm. personally because I now can understand, you know, this virus even better and how it affected someone very close to me, especially and this isn't just about, you know, who or what, you know, the Levi family, you know, as a Marshallese, we're all, you know, family. Mm -hmm. uh, we treat each other as families and things like that. You know, one thing great about being an Islander is that it doesn't matter which Pacific country, you know, you're from, you know, living next to each other, you know, in the U.S. has brought us even closer than how we live, say, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. You know, our cultures are very unique, very similar in all the Pacific nations. Mm -hmm. um, if one of us is hurt, you know, I know our hearts and prayers will always be with each other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just have a little pay, uh, faith and hope for the best. Um, like I said, you know, I, I felt sorry. And, you know, my condolences once again goes out to the families. Uh, that I know that I grew up with here in Dubuque. So just for the record. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Condolences uh, to all the lives lost. There's, I think, upwards of 100,000 um, across the country um, and so many more across the globe. Um, this is a horrific virus and um, yes, incredible loss. So yes, condolences and thoughts and prayers certainly. Um, to the family members of those who've lost loved ones. What was that experience like when you first learned someone close to you had tested, tested positive? Were you able to help that person isolate? Did that person end up in the hospital? Um, were you able to visit? What was that experience like? Yeah, we, we couldn't visit them. They were admitted to the hospital. Mm -hmm. They were on uh, respiratory units, you know, breathing tubes and things like that. Um, it was very scary for the family, everyone in the family, um, to see that person had to go through, you know, mm. you know the experience. Um, we couldn't visit him any anymore. We couldn't go to his house. His whole family was all quarantined there. Um, so we couldn't, you know, visit, you know, our nephew and all, yeah, things like that. Um, so we, we took extra precaution, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if mom and dad, you know, yeah. Elangamiro, <laughs> Yeah, 
Itta bagi nak punya parpo kenang ni nak. Ia lola kerana muka yang rumah jarai. Ia orang yang kayak ini jadi ciri kan macam apa pay. Em, yang kaya ni nak ciri kan awal ini pokok pokok. Kaya mereka worry sangat lagi. Em, tenaga ni kita lihat mereka kaki orang ni. Walau dalam kebab tadi orang ramai orang ni cari ni aku pada tu. Em, ini kerja. Marlon, for those um, who don't speak uh, Marshallese, um, could you help summarize some of the comments that your mom made? So um, she's just sharing her experience as um, of she, like when she heard that about this virus and and um, well she so my she was she was tested negative mm -hmm. but she had the symptoms and went in um, went in to check to check to see if she she was positive but uh, her results came as negative and she just she's grateful that. She doesn't have this virus, um, but I can't. I know I can. Um, so, so as mentioned in one of the as mentioned one of uh, one of the health health implications from from um, the bombings, thyroid was one of the biggest health implications. Yes. And um, I can share um, the story from someone. I'm trying to protect his identity. Yes. Um, he shared me his experience. While he was when he was admitted, and after after admission, that's great. Um, so, we like to hear about that, and uh, just so the viewers know, um, you know, we're not we're protecting people's identities by not naming na you know individuals' yeah. names um, out yeah. there. So, um, you know, we're referring to people as someone you know, and you know, we all know that you all are family in the Marshallese community here in Dubuque, um, and so it's you know. You know, you know each other well, and um, you know you are seeing this firsthand how horrible this virus is. So, yeah, Marlon, we'd love to hear their experience. So he sent me a message. He says, he says that some of the symptoms that he had was shortness of breath and chest pain. I went in. I went in Thursday of April twenty-four because I had chest pain and the doctor decided to swap test me for COVID-19. Three days later, my result came back positive. I stayed home most of the time, never left my house, except seeing my doctors for follow-ups. I got admitted just for one night because I had a difficult breathing. I was monitored just by my breathing, just in case they decided to put on either respirator or ventilator, but I, over, I overcame it with just taking antibiotics and Tylenol. So my experience was just chest pain, and and my wife stayed with me in the home. Stayed in, so after he got admitted, his wife, him and his wife and his family stayed home. So they quarantined themselves, isolated from, yeah, isolated. Um, so he says I stayed in my office for the. So he has his own office in his, in at home, at his place. So he stayed in my office for the entire three weeks, and not once. I ever got close to my wife or kid. My wife would bring food to me, leave it leave it on my door, and I would just open my door and grab the grab that food to eat. We only have one bathroom, both, but but my wife did a great job disinfecting the bathroom after I use it because my wife and my son never got sick nor have any signs of COVID nineteen symptoms. It's been four weeks. I got a release form from my doctor to return to work, and I have been in work since Monday. Wednesday of this week was my first day to be out of to be out in public shopping and taking care of bills. But I'm glad I survived. Wow! So there's, I mean, that's a profound reality too of you know homes that are tight quarters, and if there is someone who's isolating in a tight quarter with an entire family with only one shared bathroom, the diligence that you have to do to protect the rest of the family. That is significant. Well, and you've touched on this a little bit, but some of there are some Facebook questions coming in that I'd love to, 
to ask, um, it sounds a little bit like, um, you know, the, the families that have been affected um, by who have, you know, experienced COVID-19 um, are, are working. Um, this question is, um, are any of you employed in essential workforces, um, therefore having to work during this pandemic? Um, and the families, you know, or the people that you have heard from, are they working in essential services? Um, um, I work at Walmart, the Duke Walmart yeah. store. Yes. So, you know, I'm one of the um, asset protection supervisor there, uh, associate there. So, yes. um, but anyways, when, when this you know this COVID-19 got to hit us hit us very hard in in this state um, Walmart was able to reach out to its employees and giving them um, a leave of absence mm -hmm. they started off um, in the middle of March and they um, thought that they would give you a LOA by the end of April, you would come back to work, but then it got worse. But anyways, I took advantage of that because I have, you know, I have children. I have little ones in my house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't want to be out there. Um, I know it's something that, you know, it's an instinct for me because I know how bad this virus is, so I had I needed to stay. Um, all the while, I was not compensate for my leave of absence, so it kind it kind of kind of hit me a little bit sure. financially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they give you what they call PTO to use, so you can use your PTO to get paid, things like that. Mm -hmm. But you know. That's kind of like my story of able to stay away from work, mm -hmm. still have my job, yeah. and I'm going back by the end of this month. So, wow, wow. Well, and it, again, you had to make a very hard decision in it order was, to protect your very, family. Yes, yeah, very difficult. Yeah, very difficult. Well, and I, I'm looking at more Facebook questions. Art Roach uh, chimed in. He said, "Marlin's got it exactly right." <laughs> he said, "Copa." Um, he said, allows, I think this is an important thing too, allows Marshallese to come here, study, work. And then he clarifies, he says, and pay taxes. Yes, we pay taxes. <laughs> but not enjoy the benefits from paying those taxes since 1996. So you pay, you're working, you're paying taxes, and yet mm -hmm. um, not getting the benefits of healthcare and other kinds of um, vital services definitely yeah yeah um yeah definitely you know you know well let's just say you know our status is COFA migrant yes but living in america we just live just like everyone else the only thing is we do not have full access to any type of benefits we do have taxes, you know, things like that but just limited access to any type of benefits and things like that yeah 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 well this is an, an interesting comment as well um abby abby smith um says my sympathies with all the people affected i'm a first grade teacher at hoover and have been blessed to teach some of the marshallese kids um she's been watching the paper closely and during this time um and she said she's not seen any of the obituaries or notices of death of the marshallese in the newspaper um she said is there some cultural reason for that or um, how do you mourn the the loss of someone in this time? Um, we have we have a uh, community leaders, yeah, Marshall community <laughs> leaders, and there is a, a group on Facebook, Tri-State uh, yeah. Marshallese Community Group, yes. um, and a lot of the um, I, I I'm not really understanding if you know. Like, like we all know, you know, mm -hmm. funerals are very sacred yeah. in some ways. So I'm not, you know, sure if they're willing to, or even 
crescent or any type of outlets or inlets that would put that in the newspaper or it's been shared amongst the Mark Lee's families that have lost their loved ones. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, but we do see it in that group of uh, schedules and, you know, funeral dates and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're all very aware and doing what you can. I know one of the things that has been hard um, as, as I'm hearing from families who are losing loved ones um, that, you know, not only is it just devastating not to be able to be with someone you love when they are, you know, having their last moments um, in this life, but it's also devastating then to not be able to bring everybody together because everyone's isolating and, you know, we can't have large gatherings in order to mourn and to celebrate that life. And so it's been so heart wrenching for these families. And again, condolences um, to those who have had this horrific loss. Um, I'm taking a look at, you know, kind of the time here creeping up on us. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit from John Say. Um, you know, I, we haven't had a chance to hear from you yet. Um, but I want to know, what, what would you like people in Dubuque to know, um, what would you like them to know about what it's like to be a Marshallese person here in Dubuque? Um, so yeah basically he uh, wanted to explain uh, he want to give praise and thanks to Heavenly Father first and foremost um, explaining that you know he first migrated to Dubuque back in 2004 um, he had different he had different uh, goals in, in, in mind when he decided to move his family here. Um, he wanted to bring us here uh, to work. Um, he wanted us to go to school. And most importantly, he wanted to uh, be medically treated for his uh, medical conditions that he had felt that, you know, everything that we've spoken about has affected him at this age now. Um, he just want to um, say that, you know, he's just happy to live in the future. 
Well, we're very, very glad that you're here as well. And I think this, this actually leads into the, you know, a good final question for you all. Um, how can um, other people here in Dubuque support you and the Marshallese community during this time? I know, I wish you could see my comments on the live feed come through because everyone is, um, knows and loves you. <laughs> there is, everyone is commenting, saying hello to the Levi family and, you know, recognizing such a gift that you are to our community. You give us such a gift. Um, you know, what can, what can we do? What can others here in Dubuque do to support the Marshallese community? Um. I just want to, you know, I just want to personally thank certain um, organizations. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank, you know, our nonprofit organization and many of our Dubuque Town business owners who has really taken their time to lend their help, helping hand to many. Uh, I know this is a battle that would, one, if we as Dubuque community joined forces, to help each other out. Um, Crescent Community Center, Human Rights. Yes. Um, I think it's Human, uh, Marlene, I'm sorry. <laughs> human Rights VNA, Project okay. United, Project Rooted. Okay. Resources United, uh, United Project Rooted, and many others. Um, Romper Snoppers, Dream Center and our local school taking their time to provide help in this time of need. I know together as a community, you know, this battle won't be long, we can overcome. Yes. So most of all, you know, basically as a Marshallese, you know, wanting to fit in come, uh, in Dubuque, in this community here, you know, you know, start by greeting each other out, as a Marshallese, you know, if you live in such a village back home, you know, we always greet, good morning, lunch, you know, good afternoon, evening. You know, a huge sense of strong support comes, you know, by way of just greeting or say hello. So mm -hmm. just keep us in your prayers. Yes. Uh, you know, we can write this thing together. Yes, yes. Well, and I have to chime in, you know, as well to just let anyone who's viewing know that um, there is a um, bill uh, in Congress currently that um, our local Congresswoman, Abby Finkenauer, has signed on to that would bring our Marshallese community back here, our COFA migrants, back onto health care. Um, and so I will put which bill number that is in the, in the notes here um, as well, and maybe, you know, a way to contact um, Congress uh, to, to advocate for that. That is definitely one thing I know that we could do on a political level. Um, but your story is um, deeply profound, and we are so grateful that you allowed us to, you know, share in it with you. And, you know, you are an incredible gift to our community, and, um, you know, we will work hard to, to support you during these challenging times. And, um, you know, thank you for all the gifts that you've you've given to us. So it is time, everyone. I hate to have to sign off because it feels like we're just really getting into the conversation. But um, thank you um, to the Levi family. Thank you to our viewers who are tuning in. And we will continue these conversations. Um, next one will be this upcoming Monday. We are going to be talking to um, graduating high school seniors about how um, impact the impact of COVID on, on their graduation ceremonies. And then we're gonna ask the youth how, if they were in charge, how they would be handling this pandemic. So tune in on Monday at one o'clock and thank you, Levi family again. Thanks for all tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.